Live from London, England, it's theCUBE. Covering .next Conference Europe 2018. Brought to you by Nutanix. Welcome back to London, England. I'm Stu Miniman with my co-host, Yup Piskar, and we're going to dig into one of the partnerships uh, that Nutanix have. Uh, joining me, two CUBE alums, uh, Michael Cade, who's a technologist uh, with Veeam, had you on the program last year, Nice, and, and welcome back a little closer to home for you uh, here in London. Yeah, cheers, Stu. Uh, Hi, Yup. And uh, welcome, uh, six months with, with Nutanix, uh, someone I've known, CUBE alumni, so uh, wh wherever you go, uh, you know, they're, they're CUBE alumni always. So, uh, Jay Chitness, who's the head of Global Strategic Alliances with Nutanix, Jay, thanks for joining us. Stu, thanks for having me. It's great to be here, guys. All right, first, first of all, you know, Michael, for, uh, you know, what's it mean having the show here in London? And would love, you know, your opinion, having kind of, how's <laughs> Nutanix doing uh, with, with Europe adoption? Yeah, so obviously being in London, it means I don't have to get on a plane and travel anywhere, right? So um, that's one benefit. Uh, but one thing, I was there last year, obviously we spoke. I think one of the things I can see here is how many people are here. Like, it feels like it's doubled in numbers, doubled in size, double the conversations obviously with us, with our product coming out in, in July, August of this year. Only a version one, but we're seeing like good feedback, good strong feedback and, and lots of questions around that. Yeah, absolutely. 3,500 is the number I heard here. Um, you know, Jay, we're, we're, we're going to talk about it with Veeam, so set the stage for us. Data protection, uh, what's going, you know, Nutanix positioning and uh, what you yeah, look to Yeah, it's a vibrant landscape, right? Um, so, uh, just to kind of pick up a little bit on the, on the thread around the European side, we've got over 50 partners here, over 50 technology partners and, uh, and a number of channel partners. There's just a vibrant buzz and one of the first things that people always talk about is, Hey, we're in the nation of GDPR, right? If you start to think about just where's this nation, this notion of data, and where does it reside, data mobility, and that sort of thing, one of the, that's one of the first things that we get hit with all the time. Yeah. We get asked a lot, and so uh, it's really core to what we do, right? yeah. and that's where that's where the relationship really comes in. Yeah, I, well, I, I love a little commentary there about GDPR, because right, I remember last year, the end, like most of last year, every show that had data, data protection, everything, mm. we talked about GDPR a lot. To be honest, once we got past May, we didn't talk about it a lot. I mean, mm. we, we said we know it's real when there were some lawsuits, and that happened rather fast to some of the really large companies, but is this still a major conversation with customers? Where are we? And, yeah, yeah, massively. So that sovereignty of data, where it resides, is something that speaking to enterprise and mid-market customers over in Europe, they're absolutely still top of mind is why, why are we keeping that data? Where are we keeping that data? How do we leverage uh, our tool set to understand where that data is? And then actually provide some insight into where it is and report against things like violations between different locations. And just, we, we, we obviously had to go through that process of becoming GDPR compliant ourselves. And obviously as a global company, you have to kind of eat your own dog food and understand you have to know your own data, understand what that's doing, why are we keeping that, how, how, how it's being stored, and that message we just relayed back out into content and let our, let our customers then use that. So what does that look like? Maybe from a technology perspective, you know, if you have to deal with GDPR from a Nutanix standpoint, from a Veeam standpoint, what does what does it change, right? What does it change in terms of backing up? What does it change in in terms of storing it in the cloud or on-prem? Uh, have you seen any major changes in how that works for customers? Yeah. So the the good thing is is that they're thinking about what that data is and where it's being stored. They know that like in, in Germany that data may not be able to leave Germany or that data may not be able to leave the UK or Ireland and and they might have offices and remote work locations in various different countries. So a simple thing that we, we put in was the, the ability to put tagging on our repositories, on our physical constructs, so that we knew the data path and the workflow. And that was just, that's, and then be able to use then Veeam 1 to be able to report against that, so you understood where that data was going, but also it'd flag up any, any of those violations that, that, you, that maybe where a backup job has pushed it to a different location. We, we need to know about that and we need to fix it as fast as possible, so that's, that's one of the areas that we're talking. So I, I can imagine that this is you know, not only has had an impact from a technology perspective from a vendor side, mm -hmm. but also in the service provider market. You know, I, I guess you know, a lot of service providers have gone into that space to be able to help customers with their GDPR issues. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So we, we were already aligned with our VCSP program, so 20,000 
BCSP partners out there and willing to, they, their model is as a service, so being able to provide as a service and help them understand what that data is and know where that data is residing is, is key to that those customers that can't necessarily put their workloads into the public cloud, but they can put it into a trusted service provider, a BCSP. Right. Or, or, or a trusted, like an you know, enterprise private cloud. Or, you know, one of the things that we're seeing is uh, when you start to think about da data and where it resides, it's not just the cloud. It's not a discussion of is it, is it uh, on-prem, is it in the cloud. There's this notion about this distributed cloud. You know, some of the stuff that we talked about earlier this morning around, what does that mean when you start to think about where, uh, first of all, the amount of data that's sitting in, in everything other than what we would consider an enterprise cloud, that's one. The second thing is, well, how do you protect it? How do you back it up? What do you, uh, what do, you do at things that, at the edge, right? Th that requires a fundamentally different way of looking at things. Just the size and the volume of the data. Right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, one of the key things that we're seeing is that sprawl of data, not, not necessarily it doesn't really matter where that data resides, whether it is on premises or whether it's in the public cloud. It's the data and that sprawl of data that can sit on many different platforms. Yeah, all right, want to pivot the conversation a yep. little bit. Uh, let's talk about AHV. Yeah. So, uh, in the earnings announcement uh, earlier this week, uh, the number I heard was 38% looking at the last four quarters trailing, uh, so strong growth. Actually, when I'd asked Deeridge uh, about two years ago and said, okay, well, what's the goal? And he said, look, we're going to keep building and do it and customers will have choice. You know, if we get to 50%, that felt about right to him then. When I talked to him, he said, it seems right. It's not like we're going to eradicate mm. everybody's other virtualization. Mm. That's not the goal, it's to, you know, to do what makes sense. Uh, I remember, uh, at one of the dot next is when Veeam said, we are going to go down the path to adopt AHV. There were actually tears in the audience. So <laughs> we know that <laughs> ecosystem is super important it to is. AHV. So Jay, maybe set the table for us um, yeah. with that guideline as to where yeah. we are with the partner ecosystem. Obviously, Veeam's got some good, exciting stuff recently, but overall. Look, you know. at the end of the day, the 38% the number that you mentioned is, is critical, right? Um, one of the things that we look at is, uh, this is, it's, our philosophy has always been about freedom and so some semblance of choice. And it doesn't matter whether you have a preference for a private cloud, a public cloud, a hypervisor. Um, what we really are focused on is how do we enhance an incremental uh, value add, especially in the management stack, right? So with the, it's not necessarily a, uh, we, we absolutely want to become a hypervisor company. That's not the goal here, right? In order to, uh, when you look at the, our partner landscape and our partner ecosystem, it kind of fits into a few things. Um, first and foremost, it's about customers who want, when they buy Nutanix, it's because they're buying Nutanix to fit into a certain environment. Data protection, management, uh, management and orchestration, networking and security. Um, and then there's obviously customers who buy Nutanix for running something on top of us, right? An ISV, an enterprise ISV, uh, big data applications, uh, cloud native applications and things of that nature. One of the cornerstones for that, uh, for that ecosystem is to support AHV, and we're starting to see a significant amount of our a, of our partners, not only looking at supporting AHV, but actually going further and deeper. So we look at things in terms of the breadth of the ecosystem, which is great. You know, we want to grow that, but we also look at the depth. And someone like Veeam, who said, "Hey, look, we we were partnering with you and on the the breadth where we were doing some stuff around supporting ESX, but really the game changer was AHV." Yeah, yeah, AHV absolutely. support, which was what, August? Yeah, yeah, beginning of August. And I think the same premise as, as to what you were just saying, Jay, is around, so bring that simplicity model, we don't really care what that is yeah. sitting on top. With the management layer, we're offering this hardware up as a service, or this, this layer of abstraction. From a Veeam, obviously, from a Veeam perspective, it's all about the ease of use, the reliability, but also the flexibility, and that's something that we kind of have that synergistic approach. I think that's a very shared common vision, right? It's a, it's making sure that you provide a seamless experience, one click sort of experience, but be, being able to do so in a, um, in a more cohesive manner, sorry. Yeah. Michael, I, I want you to bring us inside. I, I remember back when Veeam supported you know, Microsoft Hyper-V. It was a big deal. There's a lot of engineering work that mm -hmm. goes into it, and a move Veeam was more than just a virtualization company. Today, Veeam is multi-cloud, they play in lots of environment. It, it, give us a little insight as to you know, what happened and what special has been done uh, you know, for, for the interface and the technology to fully support uh, AHV with, with Veeam. Yeah, I think, so 12 years ago, Veeam started out protecting those virtual workloads, virtualization first, VMware first, then Hyper-V. 
and then the physical agents came and really that platform started to get broadened. What um, then happened is the AHV ad adoption rate from you guys was obviously rising. So we saw that and, and went in, and but we, we took a different approach in terms of, okay, just because of what we've done in a VMware and Hyper-V world doesn't necessarily mean that that will fit our, our Nutanix AHV customers. Mm. So we went out, we seeded the market, understood what that looked like, how it looked from both Nutanix point of view and also existing AHV customers, and then built the, the the new AHV platform that we have to be able to protect them, but we still wanted to keep that agentless approach. But from a management perspective, we offer out a, a web interface that allows us to look very similar to the Prism interface, the management layer, so that an, an admin doesn't have to shift his command stage, his knowledge of working and management into that into that mindset. So version one, and again, there's, there's a considerable amount of effort gone into that as a pretty pretty full on feature list of, of features in that in that version one and that's going to continue to to roll out over 2019 and beyond. And so looking looking at this from a customer perspective, you know, back when I you know built an IS platform based on Nutanix, based on VM, you know, one of the things that was high on my list was AHV support. Uh, simply because you know AHV over the hypervisor, you know, it became a commodity. I even as a service provider, even as an IS provider, I didn't really care what hypervisor I ran. And so, you know, support from VM to, um, to actually be able to back up VMs on AHV, you know, that was top priority for me. And, you know, seeing you guys uh, use that different UI, even though it was a little bit of a shock because, you know, we've been using VM for, you know, maybe a decade already, we're used to it. A little bit of a culture shock to start using it. But when you do, you know, it, it becomes a totally different experience because it is aligned with Nutanix. So maybe tell us about, you know, why you've taken that approach of using, um, you know, that uh, the the, um, the way of integrating with the Nutanix UI instead of staying at your old uh, UI. Yeah, and and so exactly, it was so mostly around Nutanix admins and their feedback around if we can just have another tab that looks exact, looks and feels exactly how our our management plane looks like, then that would that would be a more of a benefit. Now, obviously, within being backup and replication, there's still visibility of those jobs. Now, there's no configuration. Um, later, that, that's one of the biggest asks that we're getting in the forums, in the public forums, is is when can we have the exactly what you're asking for there? Is it around how can we bring that central management back into VBR? Because they may have Nutanix clusters running different hypervisors, and that's all supported from us. But then now you've got to go outside of that that single management interface into the Prism-like management for that. So I kind of see that from that perspective. But so that was really the the main key for version one is get something out that's the same as what our, our Nutanix administrators are used to. So, you know, if we're, if we're talking about, you know, futures, right, so what's what's next for VM and Nutanix? Real, real short question, short answer maybe. Yeah, without being fired, um, but, <laughs> so, the, so version two, so update one, so 1.1, that will be out in the next few, let's say weeks, months. And what that, that really doesn't bring any major features or changes. That's that's the generic bug fixes. There's a few things that that needed to be ironed out in the in the interface, but also as the process. So that that will be relatively soon. Then the good thing around uh, the the ability to develop against what we're doing with AHV is that because it's so separate from the VBR piece, it allows us to hopefully keep that much more frequent cadence of release. So we'll, we'll, we'll be starting to see more news about version two as we get into, into early 2019. Yeah, I, I just uh, last thing, wondering what you could say about adoption so far. How much pent up demand was there? You know, I'd like to hear first from the Veeam standpoint, how many customers, if you can share anything about that, and then Jay, what this means for AHV adoption. So I don't have specific numbers, yeah. up to date numbers, but I've seen, I've, I have seen the, the Salesforce numbers grow from an opportunity perspective. Where, and that's specifically where Veeam availability for Nutanix HV is included in that in that Salesforce opportunity. So, one of the things though is that we're seeing, if you're familiar with the Veeam forums, that in particular forum thread is growing and growing because people are understanding that oh, we can we can help shape what we do here. Yeah. Like we, 
we want though those customers that are using it on a daily basis to give us that mm -hmm. feedback. Do, do you expect there to be new Veeam customers due to this offering? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. All right. Yeah, okay. I think we I think we absolutely expect new Veeam customers, right? I think at the end of the day, you go back to your question around AHV. Um, having a healthy ecosystem is really what's going to drive AHV adoption, right? So partners like Veeam who've done that. Um, is really what is providing some choice back. To your question around what, what do we expect in the next cup, you know, next few months, quarters, um, you know, what, we, what we're seeing is a lot of demand uh, on, on uh, what's the right way? We're seeing a lot more demand on, on additional functionality that people, customers would like to add into there, right? So HV is just the beginning of the platform, it's not the end state. And then you start, to, we're, we're starting to see is a lot of customers, partners who are, who are taking on things like, oh, well that's interesting, now I can do something with files or buckets or, or add on top of it, where now all of a sudden I can derive even more value. So HV is just, you know, step one, if you will, right? Yeah, I think that's important as well. So we've got update four coming out early, early next year. That's going to bring the ability to leverage the Nutanix buckets that we've heard about this week. There's also other cloud mobility, but uh, to the option of being able to convert those machines and send them up into Azure or AWS to be able to run test and development up there. But that whole cloud mobility about movement of data and making it seamless using the same tool set. One of the key differentiators is the VBK format. So those who know Veeam, they use a VBK format. Hmm. And that's gonna, that's exactly the same format that the Nutanix AHV product uses yeah, as well. Yeah, absolutely. Well, congratulations. Uh, really, really looked at, as I said, this is really opening the door to start the journey uh, as to where your customers are going. I've been hearing feedback from customers uh, that have been waiting for this for a while and uh, excited to see how this matures as things go forward. So, Jay, Michael, thanks so much for joining us and stay with us. Full day of coverage here at Nutanix.next 2018 in London. Thanks for watching theCUBE. Thank you.